for tapes of end time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. This is one of two of the Sunday afternoon service of September the 2nd, 1990. Labor Day weekend, teaching and deliverance camp meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Arlene Moody, Irma Miller, and Glenn Miller are the speakers. This afternoon, Arlene and Irma and I are going to minister, teach. We're going to tell you things that have happened either to us or we've been present or participated in what happened. And in these happenings, it has brought us to the understanding of what we're going to talk about, each one of us, this afternoon. And Brother Gene is making notes, and uh, then he will have a list of things that relate to what we talk about. And uh, when we're concluded, why then, uh, he will take over the, uh, uh, the that part of the service, and we will conclude it uh, in getting rid of some of the things that we talk about. Earlene Moody is going to come and uh, talk first. She's a retired school teacher, but she and she's going to talk about something that is firsthand with her, not something she heard about someplace else or somebody told her, but it's things that, uh, that happened in her family and in her life. All right, before we start, let's just ask the Lord to help each of us. Father, in the name of Jesus... You said your sevenfold spirit contained wisdom, wise counsel, and understanding, Lord. And we need those things this afternoon to understand this lesson. And, Father, a lot of the training we've had in schools is run contrary to what you say in your word. So help us to break through that and really believe you and not what we've learned in, like, our uh, classrooms at school sometimes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. This, in the Bible, it tells you in <clears throat> Deuteronomy... The 23rd chapter, the second verse, and we've already read this several times, you know. But it says, A person begotten out of wedlock shall not enter into the assembly of the Lord, even until its tenth generation shall his descendants not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Now, begotten out of wedlock does not mean born out of wedlock. It means conceived out of wedlock. You can conceive a child out of wedlock and get married, and pardon the old southern expression, but you ain't changed nothing. We know we can be freed from this because Jesus Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every man that hangeth on a tree. It is not automatic. You must appropriate everything that God gives into your life. He gives you some things automatically, you know, I guess life and breath and so on. But, you know, if you're not grateful for those, you can even lose those, just the regular everyday things. I'm not going to go through this example of David, but I want you to ponder it. There is no record of David's family having any trouble among his children by many wives until after he conceives a bastard with Bathsheba. Then you know what happens. Rape. Murder, hate, attempts against David's life. All right. <clears throat> now, I, I want to concentrate on how does this not entering into the congregation affect you. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't go to church. But in the times of Israel, the congregation was the whole community. So you were kind of singled out and separated, kind of like a second-class citizen. Now here, if you just let your mind go through this, you'll see some of these things could possibly be in you. The way the devil works, he doesn't do a big thing a lot of times. He does a little bitty thing. He does things so small as whenever you have to discipline your child. The child needs it. He knows he needs it. You know he needs it. So you do it. He comes to you and says, you know, it's a shame you can't get along with your child any better than that. 
Then he goes to the child and he says, if they loved you, they wouldn't hit you. And so a little seed is planted. A little web is beginning to be woven. And if, if you don't wise up to these things, you'll be like that little thing inside of the golf ball. You'll be so wound up with all this trouble and sorrow and grief that you can't, you couldn't, I couldn't believe the Lord could possibly love me. You maybe, but me, uh-uh. And let me show you some of the ways it came about in my life. In my ancestry, there were bastards. Now, my mom tells me this story, which I have not been able to co uh, collaborate every single bit of it. But I do know that part of it is true. My great-grandfather married my great-grandmother in church. He has three children by her, and he deserts her. Then he dies. And when word of his death reaches her, she asks for his pension and finds out that she's the fifth woman to ask. So even though the children were born of a marriage that was made in church, technically they are still what? All right. In my family, not anyone I know has considered, uh, conceived a child outside of wedlock. But this is actually, what he did, is actually outside of wedlock because in America we recognize what? One at a time. Too bad it's not one forever. But anyway, when a bastard is conceived, it's not conceived in love. You may fool yourself and say you love this person. And you might be the girl or the boy who's saying you love the other person. But you're lying. Because love is protective and it's providing. It suckers a person. In other words, takes care of a person. It accepts its responsibilities. All right, when a child is conceived as a bastard, it's conceived in lust. Demons of lust will follow those children and all the children conceived by any other marriage made by these two people for ten generations. All right, that's 400 years. Glenn, I think it was, told us the other day why, we had to, why they had to wait for King David. All right. Now, these are some of the everyday sort of things that you may have had to cope with due to other reasons, but also possibly due to the curse of the bastard. I, I want to say one thing before we... Jean and I, when we were studying this, going through it with me and different things like that and other people, we discovered a real shocking principle of the Bible. You would think that God, being God, and wanting us to worship him, that he would have cursed us more for not worshiping him, for going into witchcraft, for going into Satanism. But that's not true. If you go into Satanism, the curse is on your children, so provided you don't repent, get saved, and get delivered, for three to four generations. But if you conceive a bastard... You and all those who come after you for ten generations are cursed. What does God get the most disgusted with? The way we treat each other. You can't go before God and worship him in truth when you're not doing right by the people around you. Gee, it's so quiet in here. All right, here are some of the things. The person who is in the line of bastards will always have some sort of a dissatisfaction inside himself or herself. It can't be fixed. I used to think if I could have a $200 dress, it would fix it. Then I thought, well, if I have the nicest looking house around, that will fix it. But nothing fixed it. This dissatisfaction just simply can't be satisfied with earthly things. They have a lot of trouble, more so than usual, with rejection. They're always lustful, not necessarily for sex. Everything, food, clothes, shelter, honor. They refuse to take responsibility. Now that's the one thing that really stands out when you get past rejection. Is that they don't like to take responsibility and if it gets a little tough, they'll just run off somewhere else. There is an kind of a quiet little underwriting if anger can be quiet anger a lot of unprovoked murders are caused by people who have this anger they don't know what at or what to do with it so they strike out at someone they don't even know someone who doesn't even 
have any offense against them. People who are bastards don't stay on the same job very long. They have trouble with the other workers. Not only can they not accept the other workers, they have enough trouble trying to accept themselves. It keeps a couple from being able to be intimate with one another, and we're not talking about sex. We're talking just talking hours talking. A person who cannot talk about trouble or problems might need to look into this. Because these people are afraid to con- confront the problem, and they're afraid of discussing things unpleasant. They have trouble with sexual impurity, with obsessive compulsive behavior. That includes alcoholism and drugs. They are distracted from pursuing any course to success, or else they're driven to success, you know, almost to the cost of their life. Many of these things I'm calling out to you somehow kind of connect up with Asmodeus and other spirits, don't they? You know, the devil doesn't work on one thing. He kind of like is like a spider. You know, when she builds that web, one little strand at a time. And when she gets something caught in there, it doesn't get out. A lot of Ahab men have the curse of the bastard on them. A lot of Jezebel women have it. Jean and I had a real shocker one day. A lady called us who had picked up our testimony at a restaurant in Baton Rouge. We met four generations of this family at the house. We met the grandmother, the mother, her children, and were told about a grandchild. Now this is what happened, the history of this family. And I really believe the curse of the bastard was on the family of the girl, the grandmother. This is what had happened. Mother ran away from home, grandmother ran away from home at 15. She said poverty was the reason. You know, you can be poor and still love your family. She lived with a man, conceived a bastard daughter, which is the one that was the daughter in the house. The daughter runs away from her mother at 15, lives with a man, conceives a granddaughter. Lives with another man, creates another grandson bastard another granddaughter only one child of her five is legitimate and the 12 year old girl that was there that night found out she was a bastard the older sister of this young girl who found that out had almost forced a man into sex so that she could get pregnant and force him to marry her the stepfather who had come into this home was Hebrew they had found a Bible in a house they moved into and had gotten born again but he had a problem too he exposed himself to the girls now here's the family you can tell this family has found a Bible followed the instructions gotten saved in fact God is even now listen to this some men stand before churches to lead them have the Bible have the Strong's Concordance have the Young's Concordance have all the Bible dictionaries they need and they don't know anything about demons. Now that reminds me of like, Gene's an engineer. And when he got out of college, he didn't know all that he needed to know about engineering. So they put him to work. And he's supposed to build something, design something. Now, what do you think will happen if Gene looks at this thing he's supposed to build and design and he says, oh well, I don't know about these uh, plates that hold these things together, but I'll just design it anyway. And I mean, you know, maybe it'll stand up. What do you think is going to happen when the building falls? Gene will be arrested if someone is killed. And he will be tried and he will be kicked out of his profession. Why does a preacher think he can get by without it? Excuse me, preachers. (laughs) But I mean, I'm just a, a, a person who observes things. And I like to observe people. And I don't see why or how a preacher can excuse himself by saying, I don't know about demons. If this little old couple... Him always being a Jew. Picks up his Bible and sees that he needs to get saved and his family needs deliverance. What is the church coming to if it can't even tell the same thing? Okay, automatic failure works in people like that. Let's see if I can see anything else down here that I haven't told you about. Because since Jean and I gave this little talk up here, we've learned a lot of other things that we need to add to this. Antisocial behavior. Not being able to receive love. A lot of paranoia comes through these people. 
They have trouble with accepting the Bible as the truth. They cause trouble. They cause strife in churches. A lot of the families are violent. And this is one that I just have recognized in the last year or so. This demon, this family of demons, will push many men and many women into the ministry and kill them there. It'll eat your dinner. It'll push you out for ministry when you don't even know what you're talking about. It'll take you to some foreign land and have you in such a mess that by the time you get back to the United States, you don't know if there is a God. All right, people with uh, the curse of the bastard on them. And Glenn's going to tell you about another curse that's even worse. And it, it actually makes all these things even worse in a person. It will harden a person so that they have a difficult time receiving anything from God or receiving friendship even from another person. It accounts for a lot of our divorces and separations. Now, there's a family that's, and let's see. All right, here's the, here's the other part that we knew back when we gave this the first time. You never do feel at home in the church. How many of you have gone to a church, and because you didn't know anyone, it seemed like a nice place to be? But then you got to know the people. And the next thing you're knowing, you're saying, well, you know, she dresses. I don't like the way he walks. I feel like they're all looking at me, and they don't want anything to do with me. And before you know six months has passed, you're out in another church. But you don't feel good there long either. One of the big problems I had is I never felt good about myself. The next thing that was really strong in me was I was ashamed for anyone to look at me. So badly so that if I had to stand up here, I would have swallowed my feet. I couldn't have said a thing. I was always trying to succeed at something. But when I got real close to succeeding, I had another fear that would hit me. What happens after I succeed? And many times I'd quit before I finished the goal. I had a disrespect for authority. And you can see where that would come from. Here's your parents supposed to be your authorities providing and protecting and leading and guiding you and you've been thrown out into the world broadside nobody cares in fact a lot of times they've been very hostile to you before you ever got here and in today's society they might kill you fear of failure fear of authority resisting authority and distrusting authority fighting verbally and physically now when I was a kid and I was 16 and my brother was 18 he was over six foot tall. I guess he's probably as tall as any man in this, in this place. And was a big, strong German bill. And when he made me mad to a certain point, he ran. It didn't bother him at all to fight a six foot man. But I could beat him up. What was that? That was a demon. That was power, strength given to me by a demon. When I was young, there was demonic pressure to be inquisitive about sexual things. I don't know how God protected me from getting into a mess, but somehow he did. There is not much joy in your natural or your spiritual life. The things that are around you, like your children, your husband, your house, your work, your cars, whatever you are engaged in, male or female, is not really interesting. You're always looking for something else. And this is why many women who have young children, and I find children some of the most exciting critters in the whole wide world. I mean, I have always loved children. But a lot of people who are under this curse can't think of anything to do with their children except feed them, clothe them, and put them out of the way. The fun of having a child and taking it places and letting it see the world for the first time and and loving it and letting it hug you. We had Linda down at the house this past week, and I didn't know how she was going to go with our little grandson. I didn't know if she'd like him or he'd like her, and I, and I didn't know what would happen. So about the second time he was around her, she started to leave, and he says, One more time. He wanted one more hug and one more kiss. And, you know, I just think it's so wonderful when people can enjoy their family members. Because, see, as a child, I didn't. 
Fortunately, God had mercy on me, and I did enjoy my two children, even though I wasn't delivered. But, you know, God has been very merciful to me. I was an abused child, but I didn't abuse my children. So I know that God does have mercy, but I think we have to be looking for him. And when I was young, I looked for him. Now, there are some more things in here that... um, uh, you know, if you have an unusual weakness of bowing into your peers, or you don't trust your parents, these are things that young people have so much of. Now, if you think you can come to God and worship Him and have a lot of joy and a pure heart and still be full of a lot of wickedness, you're wrong. As long as your your aim and your goal is toward Him, your joy will grow as you obey. Grow as you obey. But if you come to a point and there's something that has to be done and you refuse, you will notice your joy slightly dips backward. It won't be quite there like it was before. All right, now we're going to take a family called the Calicac family. You know, I think if that had been my name, I might have had some problems anyway. But this Calicac family lived in, I guess, the late 1900s or early 20th century. The book that it comes out of is written, is published by the Macmillan Company in New York. They, they keep records, you know. If you're on welfare, there's a big record for you. All right, Father Martin Sr., now he was a pretty good fellow. He, didn't, uh, he probably didn't do anything really that much wrong. He was an Englishman. He was a middle class. Uh, both of his parents were slightly feeble-minded. And he had 41 children, offspring, you know, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, so on like that. 220 of those were feeble-minded children, and only two were normal. But look at his first marriage. His first marriage was an honorable marriage, had 496 descendants, all were normal, three listed as degenerates, two alcoholics and one sexually loose. Now, this is what he did first. He had a good family. The war comes along. After the war, he gets drunk. He's at a pub. How many times does this happen? He's at a pub. He gets drunk. He has sex with a woman, has a child, Martin Jr. Of those, there's 480 descendants. Only 46 are normal. 36 are illegitimate. 33 are sexually immoral. 24 are confirmed alcoholics. 3 are epileptics. 82 die in infancy, 3 criminals, 8 keepers of houses of ill repute. Of this large group of offspring, 1,146 altogether, 262 were feeble-minded, 197 considered normal, and 581 undetermined. That's his total amount. But you see, this second one that he did, that he conceived at the pub, was a bastard. So while his, his normal family did fairly well, Only three degenerates, two alcoholics and one sexually loose. But the other family was a story of downhill the whole way. Irma, where are you hiding? Oh, (laughs) right behind my back. You can't even hide, can you? (laughs) Earlene did good. Irma will try to do good. (laughs) Well, I'm going to talk about unbelief. Because a lot of people are getting healed and delivered here, aren't they? And I was telling the girls upstairs a day or two, no doubt, the enemy will come. And he'll say, he'll give you a symptom. And he'll say, or you really didn't get healed. If you entertain that thought very long, he's going to, to come in with stronger. And pretty soon he's back in you. And I know we haven't had a lot of teaching this time on how to hold your deliverance or how to keep your deliverance. So I'm going to discuss unbelief first. And uh, then I'm going to discuss something else in a minute or two. How long, did you, how long are we supposed to talk? Ten minutes, 15, 20 minutes? How many is tired? Well, we better stand up and come against tired spirits, first of all, then. <laughs> you know, there are tired spirits. I mean, they're, they're mean devils. Yeah, they love to settle in and kind of go to sleep. Father, in the name of Jesus, 
takes authority now over these tired spirits. We're all tired, but we will not tolerate tiredness today. We will not give in to tiredness. And in the name of Jesus, we command uh, sleepiness and tiredness and lethargy to go in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Everybody say, praise you, Jesus. Praise Praise God. Okay. Mark 9.23. Jesus said, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. How many, how many of you is all things possible? Well, that's theory, isn't it? But is it really? I mean, are we able to walk into a hospital and clean the whole place out? We are. (laughs) We're working with it. Dr. Price used to say in the last days that laymen would walk into hospitals, walk down the corridors, nobody would know who they were, and the cripples would get up out of bed and the, the lame would walk and leap and everybody in the whole hospital would be healed, and not one soul would ever know who prayed that prayer. You know, we all like to say, well, I prayed for so-and-so, and and they got, and I I did this, and I did that. So that's what Dr. Price used to prophesy way back in, when was that, Glenn? In the the 30s, late 30s, 30s. and, uh, and, and I believe that's possible. Now, I remember when Catherine Kuhlman was called to Cedars of Lebanon Hospital for, um, uh, what was his name, Howard Hughes, when he was dying, when she walked down that corridor, a lot of people got right up out of their beds and and, uh, were healed. So it's possible, see. All things are possible to them that believe. So if, if that is not being possible to us all today, we need to check out on our unbelief. Uh, Let's see now, we're going to look at uh, the 24th verse. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Let's all say, help thou mine unbelief. We're saying it to Jesus. Help thou mine unbelief. Do you think there's help in Jesus? Yes. All right, let's go to Mark 16 and 17. Mark 16 and 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. We've been doing that, haven't we? They shall speak with new tongues. How many speak in tongues? How many do not speak in tongues fluently? Put up your hands. One, two, three, four. Okay. Five. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. I used to think that meant Los Angeles water. <laughs> Every time I'd have to drink it when it was the summer, it was green color. They shall lay hands on the sick. We do that, and they do recover. But not everybody recovers, but, but the majority of people do recover. Now, there's instant healings, and there's recovery healings. You know, when you go to the hospital and you're operated on, the doctor may say, now, it will take you six months to recover, don't they? Or, or they might say six weeks. I forgot what they told Glenn it would, his recovery would be. I think he defied them, though, uh, with his hip, broken hip, because he is walking really pretty good right now. And we praise the Lord for that. Okay. Now let's go to one more scripture. Uh, let me find this. I don't think I'm too well prepared. This, this was sprung on me. Uh, Luke. 1 and 20. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak. I have written in my margin, unbelief makes us dumb. Well, let's see what, let's see what the Bible says. <laughs> and this is about Zacharias. Until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words. He would not believe the angel's words, would he? which shall be fulfilled. So I wrote in my margin, unbelief will make us dumb. Is everybody in agreement with that? Okay. There's another scripture in Isaiah 7 and 9. There are lots of scriptures you can get your concordance and run them. It's good to run scriptures on just certain words. It helps you. Isaiah 7 and 9. 
last part of it. If ye will not believe, surely you shall not be established. You know, there's a lot of people that's not rooted and grounded, and they're not established. They're not established in the Word. They're not established in, in their work habits. They're not established in, in their uh, studying of the Bible. They just can't get established, and it's because of unbelief. Now, I'm going to tell you of an incident. I like to re- refer to these incidents because they, the Lord has dealt with Glenn and I where, where it seems like these things are sort of drastic happenings, so we won't ever forget them. We were in the Evangelistic Temple in Houston, Texas in 69, I believe, with Brother Prince, and I was in the foyer uh, with, the, with his books and tapes. And uh, they had, they had, he was staying with a very famous architect in town, so they invited this other, another architect to come and hear him that morning, and they wanted everything to be peace and quiet and lovely that morning in church, and he was talking on the bear with the, is it the bear with the bone in its mouth or jaw or something, whatever it was, he talking on the prophecy in the Old Testament, and it was a nice service. And at the end, the doors coming out in the foyer were closed. But at the end of the service, when almost everybody had left, I heard a woman scream, bloody murder, you know. So I went to the door, and I looked, and I saw Brother Prince and the architect and, and the people he was staying with, and all of them, go out the back door. I thought, I wonder who in the world screamed. So I didn't pay much attention to it. I went back, and and, uh, and there was a, a lady came up to the table, and she was over there to the cancer hospital from uh, Vicksburg, Mississippi, and she was had been pretty sick, but every day she'd come to the meetings, and, and she took a great liking to me, and I would encourage her and lay hands on her and pray for her and and talk with her that whole week. It was a whole week of meetings, twice a day. And so I, I um, she started to cry. She was telling me goodbye because she knew we were going to leave the next day, and she was going to go to go home. And I think they had told her to go home to die, which is not very good news for anybody. So she began to weep. And when she did, another woman dressed in, in it was when polyester first came out, and they were dressed, she was dressed in a white ensemble, one of those long white coats with a white dress under it. And then she was a beautiful woman. She had prematurely gray hair, fixed up really pretty. And... Uh, so I said to this cancerous woman, I said, now, don't cry. Don't let that spirit of grief take you over. And all of a sudden, this woman dressed in white, this beautiful woman, she says, she don't have a spirit of grief. And she screamed this same blood-curdling scream and fell down under my table. Well, at that time, we never attacked a demon. We only did what Brother Prince told us to do. When he told us to fast, we'd fast and pray, and we, he, we would pray for those around that he would point, pray for them, pray for them, that's the spirit of so-and-so, and that's the spirit of so-and-so, and he was training us. And, and uh, so I was looking around for somebody <laughs> to help pray. And and so a minister's wife, an orthodox, an orthodox, you know, when everything else fails, you have to get with it yourself. And I think the Lord likes to push us all into this. But, so I get down on my knees beside this woman that was screaming, kicking up her legs and carrying on and she had big huge diamonds I mean the real kind throwing her hands like this on this flagstone in the foyer and just trying to rip her clothes off and everything and and this other woman and I were praying and there was a preacher came by and he took a look and then he went on (laughs) and he left (laughs) that's one of those (laughs) preachers and then pretty soon uh, uh, the the <laughs> the music director, <laughs> the music director comes by with a policeman because <laughs> they'd had a robbery the night before, and and just before he came in, she got she laid real quiet, which I thank the Lord for to this day. <laughs> and the policeman says, "Oh my." Can I do something? And the fellow said, no, I believe she has fainted. He knew better. <laughs> and he said, uh, look, come on, we'll go on down. I'll show you where the window was broke out. So he left. Then we started coming against Satan again. And and to make a long story short, and it was quite a long ordeal, why, 
Oh, yeah, the preacher said I was down, all the way down the freeway, and the Lord told me to come back. So, praise God, he was listening to Jesus. And so he came back, and we began to pray. And he stayed a while, and a lot of things would come out of her. But we weren't getting the big boy. And we didn't know what it was. And so pretty soon she kind of set up, and she said, the demon said, you don't know my name, said it and laughed, you know, how that always has made me angry when they do like that to me. Then he said, you know, you got to get mad at the devil. You, you're not going to, no namby pambies are going to get any devil out of anybody. So, so she, she, this thing said about three times that. And, and we just began to pray in tongues, this other woman and I, the, the other man had gone. And and all of a sudden, right out of me, out of my innermost being, come, no, we don't know your name, but the Holy Ghost knows your name, and Jesus knows your name, and the Father knows your name, and in the name of Jesus, I command you to give us your name. It said, my name is unbelief. I kill the Christians. I won't let them believe they're healed. Huh. I kill more Christians than death gets. I, I can kill them. And, and... Now, you think that isn't. <laughs> it's the truth. I have watched many people be healed, and about three or four days they lose their healing. How many have had a healing and then lost it? It's this unbelief that comes in. So we have to, now that we've found out the truth, we have to guard against that. You know, I appreciate people telling of their experiences because I can glean. I appreciate Jesus telling us all about Mary Magdalene having seven demons and and Thomas being a doubter and all that. You know, we're all human beings that the enemy is going to attack. Well, anyway, that spirit came out of her. Oh, first it said, this is my home. I've been here since she was four years old, and I have no place to go, and I am not coming out. Well, I knew it was going to come out. I didn't know how long it was going to take, so we just kept praying in tongues and commanding and commanding. And finally it came out. And when she sat up and, and began to praise the Lord, I said, what in the world happened to you when you were four years old? She said, a mad dog came in our front yard. And uh, she said, my mother ran out and grabbed my brother and I and just threw us into the house. And grabbed a gun and shot the dog. And, and that fear came in, but see, with fear came unbelief. And he had stayed in there all that time. Well, I thought that was a, a fairly good thing to bring up today because we all have to face unbelief, don't we? We have to face it, and, and we have to conquer it, and we have to overcome it. Now, overcomers are going to get all the rewards in the book of Revelation, aren't they? And if we didn't have any trials or if we didn't have any of these things to overcome, then we wouldn't be an overcomer, would we? So we have to endure these things and, and we have to learn about them. So if thou canst not believe, thou will not be established. And there's a lot of, you can look up the word established and you'll find that all the time. It's always connected with unbelief. While Brother Prince was at our house, the ten days he was there. Now, you may think I'm using him a lot because he only cast a few things out of me. You ought to see all the other things that other preachers have cast out of me. But, but I'm going to bring this up. How many people have trouble reading the Word of God and remembering it? Well, he said, he said uh, I want to pray he, he, he and his wife said, uh, come in the bedroom. Uh, we're, we want to uh, pray some more for you. And I don't know, Glenn had to go someplace. And so we went in their bedroom where they were staying. They were getting ready to go back to Florida. And uh, uh, he began to, they had, we had a wrought iron kitchen chair. And he set me down in this chair in the middle of this bedroom. And he... Uh, began to come against various things. And one thing that he came against was a spirit of forgetfulness. And I thought, how strange. Because I could always remember 
my spelling words. I was always an A student. I could I could remember people's names when I worked behind the book table at all the four gospel conventions. I I would explain to Glenn what people had on, who they were, you know, and they come from far and wide. And I could remember all those things. So w- the first time he said, "Come out, you spirit of unbelief," my shoulders jerked like that, and I thought, "Wow, what is this?" And I never thought. I couldn't imagine what it was. So I just sat there. You know, when the man of God sees something, you better let him pray for you. Even if you do. see, I could have said, no, I don't have that. No, I can remember everything. So he kept on commanding this thing to come out. And it kept on, you know, talking back to him. And, and, and all of a sudden, my hands began to go like this. And I could not control myself. And, and he kept, it kept on, and it would throw me on the floor, literally throw me on the floor, and they'd set me back up in the chair, and they'd start coming against unbelief or uh, uh, forgetfulness, <laughs> and and, <laughs> and and I would I would think, oh oh, what in the world is this? And, and he would keep coming against it, and it finally said, no, we're not coming out. And it sounded like a man's voice coming out of me. It was like I was sitting way over there watching this incident go on. And he kept telling it, you know, that he had power and authority over it. And he kept saying that and saying that. And and uh, it would throw me around. And then it would, uh, he'd get me back on the chair, Mrs. Prince. And finally he said, how do you affect her? And he had said, I won't let her believe the word of God, and I won't let her remember the word of God. Well, how can you cast out a demon if you don't know the word of God, if you can't remember it? And I thought, hey, that is true. Because I can remember reading down a whole page and thinking, what in the, what did I read? I better start over again. I'd read again, and, and my mind would wander. And I, I wouldn't be able to concentrate. Yet I could read other things. And I can remember everything. How many can remember gossip? <laughs> you know, if you can remember gossip, you ought to be able to remember the Word of God. And I thought, this is really something. Well, it finally threw me around so bad. And he was, and Mrs. Prince, the old, older Mr. Mrs. Prince, his first wife, before she died, she had a way of getting in high gear in tongues. I call it, you know, just, uh, and she started praying in tongues real strong. And, and Brother Prince said, bow to Jesus and come out. You spirit of forgetfulness, I command you to come out. And the next thing I know, I was on my knees, and it was coming out. And that was that was such a hard deliverance that the next day I just laid like I was dead because I felt like I'd been run over with a Mack truck. So I'm wondering this afternoon how many people have trouble remembering the Word of God. Let's see your hands again. Let's all be honest. We're all just... We're all just troubled with all these different things and once we find out about them so that's all I'm going to say and uh, then but we are going to pray now you keep that in your mind try to keep that in your mind about unbelief <laughs> unbelief and, and the spirit of forgetfulness that's the two that and, and what did she teach on what are we going to come on Bastard, curse of the bastard. That's a ten-year generation, or ten, ten generation, ten-year generation, ten-year, de- ten generations. I need to go to bed, <laughs> and I don't take naps. Only on Sunday afternoon. But is this Sunday afternoon? Well, no wonder. <laughs> that is what is the matter with me. <laughs> See that your body, you know, your body wants to rule you. He was asking me today, this morning, how do you people keep up? I said, we don't give in to our bodies. But you see, on Sunday afternoon, I give in and lie down. (laughs) I never get to sleep very long because the phone rings. She's got... So if, if you think, and you probably do, if you haven't been prayed for before, you probably do have... A curse of the bastard on you because we don't know what happened the last 400 years in our family line and and now there's so many illegitimate children we have to face facts you see we have come to a wall and we've got to press on in and 
I know when I first heard about deliverance, I felt that I had not moved a bit in God for years. Have you ever felt like that? Just hadn't moved on in the Lord any. And, and all these things, all these deliverances help you move on and move on and move on. So we're going to have forgetfulness and unbelief. That's the only two things I have to talk about. And, and how to hold your deliverance is fight, having done all, stand against the enemy. I told them upstairs, the minute you get this thought, see it's in our minds where the enemy comes at us. The minute you get your, this thought, you were not delivered. You were really not delivered. You were really not. He'll say, no, in the name of Jesus, I command you to leave me now and get rid of it right then. He's afraid of you. He's afraid of you. And I'm afraid of my husband, too. (laughs) Don't. We all have to fight unbelief. And we've got to overcome it. So when we say it is written that it transpires because that's the authority and the place that the Lord has placed us in and if we don't do it nobody else is going to that's right we're it whether we like it or not we're still it and it's our responsibility whether 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 I uh, I feel like doing something or don't feel like it I still have to do it I can uh, If I said I didn't feel like getting up this morning, we'd have been in a mess around here today, wouldn't we? No tapes. Nobody take the offering. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we have to. We have to do, regardless. Like Irma said, see, we spent many years in the aerospace missile industry, and then had our own publication company. And uh, first, we had the bakery business, which was a 24-hour a day, seven-day-a-week business. We had a large chain of bakeries. Then, by reasons beyond our control, why we didn't have them anymore. And then uh, we got involved in the aerospace missile industry after the bakery business. And I went worked for one company, and Irma worked for another. I worked for a company called Monasco, who built landing gears and missile fuel tanks. Irma worked for Lockheed. And uh, <clears throat> both companies got wrapped up in the aer- aerospace uh, or in the uh, uh, moon project and the missile projects and this. And our jobs became uh, 12, 15-hour day on the job, and sometimes longer. And uh, we had, to, and we had to learn to tell our bodies what to do, not them tell us. And we still do that pretty well. We tell our bodies what they're going to do; they don't tell us what what we're going to do. And if you learn to do that, you'll do a whole lot more for the Lord. When we had the publication company, which the Lord sold for us, which initially bought this campground, we had we we had contracts that were seven days a week, 24 hours a day. We had no choice. That was the contract. That's what it required. They were government contracts, uh, top security, moonshot program, uh, guided missiles. Uh, um, trip to the Mar- to Mars, the space station, the telescope that's out there now, and other things. Uh, we worked on all that back in our, in, in when we had our uh, company. And our contracts required that Irma and I, it spelled out that Irma and I be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But you see, the man got on the moon, didn't he? Because of dedication. Where's the kingdom of God? No. Yes, that's true. That's true. But where is the kingdom of God? When we get dedicated people, we'll, we'll f- see the kingdom of God. We don't have enough dedicated people to the kingdom. They want the kingdom given to them on a silver platter, and they think it's going to happen that way, and it's not. The kingdom of God is not going to come in except by fighting, 
kicking and screaming and persevering. It said the violent take it by force. And, it, and the word means just what it says. The violent will take it by force. And we've got to learn to be those violent ones to take it by force. It's not easy. It's not nice. But it's still the truth. It says, It is written, Satan, Jesus is Lord. And he said, I give unto you authority in my name to set the captives free. And that, and he, sa and he says that we're his battle axe. Well, if we're his battle axe, then a battle axe is used to, to, to fight with and to do some, some slaughter. So we're, we're required to do some slaughtering for the Lord in the realm of setting the captives free. Well, my subject is not that. My subject is incest. Incest. This is the end of Part A. Please play Part B. Thank you. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. For tapes of end-time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and LHBC Online. Dot com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. This is now the conclusion of this message from Part A of the Sunday afternoon service of September the 2nd, 1990, the Labor Day weekend teaching and deliverance camp meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Earlene Moody, Irma Miller, and Glenn Miller are the speakers on this. My subject is incest. How did we ever get involved in that? Well, Skip Mondragon, the boy that we prayed for, some of you don't know who we're talking about, but when we were uh, first night here, why, uh, we prayed for him and his family. He's now a medical doctor, graduated from ORU, and uh, he lived here in the campground for a while. But anyway, over, when he was over to ORU going to school, why, he uh, set up uh, two different times, he set up... Uh, for us to come over and teach a group of students. And so uh, this one time we were, uh, we had uh, 35 young people, students, and three uh, uh, instructors from ORU one afternoon. And uh, uh, we were uh, t teaching them. And uh, uh, I didn't tell them what I was going to talk about. And I had never talked on this subject before. And uh, I really don't know why I talked on it, because I really didn't know too much about it. But I talked to these young people about being holy and righteous and to stay away from sexual sins. And I found out since then that every pastor and Sunday school a superintendent and every Sunday school teacher should teach it from the Sunday school class, from the youngest class up. Then we wouldn't have all this problem in the schools that they're teaching all this junk in the schools. Because they would understand and have a fear of God in relationship to the sexual uh, sins. They have no fear of God and no fear of the sexual sins. Because we, we've never been taught. I was never taught. I happened to live on a farm, so I had a little bit of knowledge because of that. But I had no knowledge of the fear of God because, because the Scripture said, you shall not do these things. I was never told, never heard anybody ever teach on what we're talking about this afternoon until I heard myself do it to this group of kids and, and instructors over in Tulsa the day we were over there and teaching them. That's the first time I ever heard this subject ever talked about. And that's a, a shame. Because it, is a, it, it should be a required subject from every pulpit and, and every Sunday school class. And we do away with all this promiscuous uh, problem with, with uh, 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 sexual sins and uh, abortion and uh, illegitimate children. Because if it was taught right here, it wouldn't be happening out there. I'm, I'm kind of hard on that. I'll tell you the, 
ministers have let us down. And uh, not only that, but our parents should... Uh, but they didn't know any better either, because nobody taught them. Anyway, I taught on this subject of the sexual sins, and uh, Irma's told me later that she liked to faint it, because she just couldn't see why I would talk about such a subject to this group of lily-white, pure-looking kids. And the uh, only reason I know is the Lord laid it on me to do it. And I'm glad he did, because since then I have learned many things, and I've talked about it many times. Uh, but uh, when, when I finished, why well, we had a mass deliverance service, and I called out the different things, which Gene will do here this, this afternoon, of, uh, of incest and, uh, and uh, fornication, adultery, and these things. I called them out, and... And I started to. I prayed, and I started to. And all the time I was talking, there was an instructor, woman instructor, sitting on a chair right by the door. We were in a house that had been converted into a meeting, a meeting place, and the living room and dining room were set up as an auditorium. And she was sitting right by the front door in a chair. And I kept thinking from her looks that any minute she was going to get up and walk out, because that's just the way she looked at me. And uh, so when I prayed a prayer and then started to take authority over the, the spirits, this woman gave a scream and fell to the floor, just like this lady did Irma was describing. She fell to the floor. Only instead of trying to tear her clothes off and pound on the floor, she began to slither across the floor like a serpent. Well, that brought everybody to attention. And for about, and for about, for about two hours or better, well, at least two hours, we had a zoo in that place. I mean, literally, we had a zoo. And uh, when it, about a couple of hours after... This was going on, and I began to quiet down, and Sherry, uh, Skip's future wife, and another girl were over in the corner with a girl praying with her, and they'd been there quite a while, and they were just, uh, and finally they looked at me and called me over, and I went over, and they weren't getting anywhere with this girl, and she kept saying, I can't, and all they get out of her was, I can't, I can't. I can't. And so uh, uh, I went and got Irma, and I said, Irma, as soon as you get a chance, go in and see what you, what's the matter with that girl. Uh, the, and so Irma went over, and this was a beautiful blonde-headed girl, about 18. And uh, <clears throat> she was Dutch descent from Michigan. And uh, the root of the problem was that the reason she said she can't was because it's almost Thanksgiving time. She's supposed to go home for Thanksgiving. And she can't go home. Come to find out, her mother and father are Christians. She says they had the Holy Spirit. But her mother had molested her, her sister, and two brothers ever since she could remember. Incest. Yet, she said her mother was saved and had the Holy Spirit. See, how can that be? You know, there's a scripture in the Bible. I never thought of it till just this second that says salt water and sweet water should not come out of the same fountain. It didn't say they don't. It said they shouldn't. See, there's, there's the mixture. And uh, that, was, that's the problem, that was the problem there. Well, anyway, the girl got set free, forgave her mother, and prayed with her. We hope that she was able to be a help to her mother. So that was our opening to incest. And from then till now, we have had many, many, many cases of incest that we've dealt with. All the way from pastors, deacons, and the congregation. We've had cases to deal with. From I don't know what the youngest was we've ever had. We had one who was in her 70s had never been married and couldn't 
didn't want to be around men. Had a, I think she had a hatred for men, didn't she, or not? But anyway, Irma and some others, Patty or some others, prayed with her here just a, just about two and a half or three years ago. She was in her seventies. God marvelously delivered her from this when she was a little child. This incest. Since then, <laughs> she's happily married. <laughs> <laughs> so there's hope for everybody. <laughs> and uh, it's really wonderful. Well, ten-generation curse follows incest. Ten-generation curse, curse of the bastard. But it's also, Earlene read a verse in Deuteronomy 23, verse 2. I'll read Deuteronomy 23, verse 3. It says, An Amorite or a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. Now, ten generations we've figured up. I heard uh, uh, Gene and, uh, and Doc uh, make a remark about it, and I've got it marked down uh, in here too. Uh, uh, ten generations is a thousand and twelve ancestors. So if you've got an incest curse behind you, curse of sexual sins, uh, you've got a thousand and ten curses stacked on top of you if they've all committed some kind of sexual sin behind you. And uh, either Doc or uh, Gene, one or the other, was saying, that's like taking a funnel up here and putting you at the bottom of the funnel and pouring all that in on top of you. It's pretty filthy, isn't it? That's where we stand. That's what we carry on our shoulders. And I don't believe that any person present here is, is free or clean of the spirit of incest or sexual sins. Because in ten, you don't even know what your grandfather did, let alone your dad. And you stack that up ten times on both sides of the family as it multiplies back a thousand and twelve times back up there. And you've got some pretty rotten stuff. And God says that, <clears throat> that it, you can't enter the congregation of the righteous to the tenth generation. Now, who, so we understand, uh, uh, Genesis chapter 19, page 18, will, it will tell you who uh, these, people, these people are. Verse 36 says, Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. And the firstborn very son, and called his name Moab, the same as the father of the Moabites unto this day. And the younger, she also very son, and called his name Ben Ammoni, the same as the father of the children of Ammon unto this day. Incest. Children by incest. A ten generation curse on ancestral relations. Now let's look and see what the scriptures tell us about incest. Leviticus chapter 18. Excuse me. You're right, but I've got the wrong place. I have Numbers 18. And that won't do. All I have to do is look in my Bible and find the page that's about ready to fall out, and that's it. We will start with the fourth verse. I read part of this, I think, already the other day for some reason. So you shall do my judgments and keep mine ordinances to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. So if we keep the commandments of the Lord, the statutes and the judgments of the Lord, he says we'll live. We'll find out later what he says if we don't do it. He's, and then... Now, he says, None of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. Now, let's understand what this uncover their nakedness is. That is sexual relations. That's not just taking their clothes off of them. That is sexual relations that that, that is talking about. The nakedness of thy father, it says, near of kin. The near of kin you shall not. And uh, there are laws in the land that says you can't marry to what, your fourth, fourth cousin? 
in some states. Uh, and that's God's law. The nakedness of thy uh, father or the nakedness of thy mother thou shalt not uncover. She is thy mother, and thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. The, the nakedness of thy father's wife shalt thou not uncover. It is thy father's nakedness. The nakedness of thy sister. Now remember here, this word nakedness is, is just plain sexual relations. The nakedness of thy sister the daughter of thy father or the daughter of thy mother, whether she be born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover. Now, I like that verse because it puts a whole family in prospectus, no matter what the relationship is, that verse. If your mother has died or your father has died and your mother or father remarry and there's children on both sides of the family, see, that puts a mother and father together who are remarrying, who have lost their mates, but both already have children, puts them together, and then they have additional children. So you've got three families here in one verse. Uh, the nakedness of thy son's daughter or thy daughter's daughter, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover, for theirs is thine own nakedness. And it, it takes in the whole family. Any way you can, can figure it, God's got it listed here. Uh, the nakedness of thy father's wife's daughter... Begotten of thy father, she is thy sister, thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's sister, she is thy father's near kinsman, kinswoman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister, for she is thy mother's near kinswoman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's brother, thou shalt not approach unto his wife, she is thine aunt. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy daughter-in-law, she is thy son's wife. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy brother's wife. It is thy brother's nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter. Neither shalt thou take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter, for they are her near kinswoman. It is wickedness. Neither shalt thou take a wife to her sister to vex her, to uncover her nakedness besides the other in her lifetime. In other words, God changed the law here where uh, uh, Jacob got two sisters. See? Now, God says, you're not supposed to do that. Now, Jacob didn't, Jacob didn't do that himself. Jacob was conned into that. But God put a stop to it here in here that it wouldn't happen again by anybody doing it deliberately. Two sisters, you, you, you can't have two sisters for wife. Uh, <clears throat> neither shalt thou take a wife to her sister to vex her to uncover her nakedness besides the other in her lifetime. Also, thou shalt not approach unto a woman to uncover her nakedness as long as she is put apart for uncleanness. Now, that's what we talked about here the other day where, where I had uh, read this other uh, beginning of chapter 18. I knew I had read it for some reason here since we've been having camp meeting this weekend. <clears throat> uh Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife, adultery, to defile thyself with her. And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Moloch, abortion. Neither shalt thou profane the name of the Lord thy God. I am the Lord. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind, be uh, a homosexuality and uh, uh, lesbianism. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therein. Neither shalt... Any woman stand before a beast to lie down. It is confusion, bestiality. Defile not yourself in any of these things. Now, I want you to notice that this whole chapter says, You shall not. It says, You shall not. <clears throat> okay. Let's uh, turn over to uh, chapter 19. And uh, we will... 19 or 20? It's uh, 20, I uh, chapter 20 I want. Start with verse 7. <clears throat> chapter 20, verse 7 says, Sanctify yourselves therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. doesn't say, think about it. Might, I might do it. He says, do it. Sanctify yourself and be holy. And you shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctifieth you. He doesn't say, would you like to do it? Do you want to do it? He says, do it. 
verse 11. And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion. Their blood shall be upon them. Verse 17. We could read the others, but uh, we've already read all that. But I'm dealing with, uh, with mainly with the incest part. If a man shall take his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, and see her nakedness, and she see his nakedness, it is a wicked thing. They shall be cut off in the sight of their people. He hath uncovered his sister's nakedness. He shall bear his iniquity. Verse 19, we've studied verse 18 the other day. Verse 19, and Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister, nor thy father's sister, for he uncovereth his near kin, they shall bear their iniquity. If a man lie with his uncle's wife, he hath uncovered his uncle's nakedness. They shall bear their sin, they shall die childless. <clears throat> you shall therefore keep my statutes and all my judgments and do them. He doesn't ask us if we want to, if we'd like to. He says, do it. Verse 26 says, And you shall be holy unto me, for I the Lord am holy, and have severed you from other people, that you should be mine. And we come to the Lord and acknowledge and make Jesus Lord, then we belong to the Lord, and we're His. And He says that we shall be holy unto Him, because we belong. He says, you are mine. So it is our responsibility to uh, live holy in, in holiness. Uh, Deuteronomy 27 Deuteronomy 27, verse 20. Cursed be he that lieth with his father's wife, because he uncovereth his father's skirt. And all the people answer and say, Amen. Cursed be he that lieth with any manner of beast, bestiality. Cursed be he that lieth with his sister, the daughter of his father, or the daughter of his mother. Cursed be he that lieth with his mother-in-law. Cursed be he that smiteth his neighbor. Cursed be he that taketh the reward. And 26 says, Cursed be he that confirmeth not to do all the words of, of this law to do them, and all the people shall say, Amen. Now, I want you to notice the progression of the three chapters we've read out of. The first one said, 18, chapter 18 said, You shall not. The the chapter 20 said that you'll be stoned or cut off. Cut off means you'll die from some sickness or disease or something will happen to you before your allotted time. You're cut off. Uh, you, whatever it is. And verse chapter 27 of Deuteronomy says that you're cursed. So there's a progression. You're told not to. And you said that you'll be stoned or killed, and then the Lord says that you be that he that he places a curse upon you. And we've read that it's a ten generation curse, the sexual sins and incest is a ten generation curse that God says He visits upon His upon us when we disobey His word. Uh, chapter twenty eight of Deuteronomy, verse fifty eight <clears throat> says if thou wilt not observe to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that thou mayest fear this glorious and fearful name, the Lord thy God, and Jesus is his name, then the Lord will make thy plagues many and great, wonderful, it says in the King James, and the plagues of thy seed, even great plagues, and of long continuance, and sore sickness, and of long continuance. He said that two times. Moreover, he will bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt, which thou wast afraid of, and they shall cleave unto thee. Also, every sickness and every plague, which is not written in the book of this law, them will the Lord bring upon thee until thou be destroyed. So, God says that he does it if we disobey his word. And uh, I'll tell you, we're being destroyed, aren't we? Why? We've disobeyed his word. Our ancestors have. But thank the Lord, he's made a way of escape. 
And Jesus is that way. The blood of Jesus is, our, is the cleansing and washing of our sins. And, and, uh, and the fact that Jesus became a curse by hanging on the tree gives us the authority of Galatians 3.13 to break the power of the curse. Now, Catholicism, they pray to the dead saints and that. And Mormonism says that you can get the dead saint saved. But I don't find that in the Scriptures. But I do find that we can take the blood of Jesus and the, and the, the fact that Jesus became a curse, and take authority over the curses that have come down the, through the, the family line from our ancestors and separate those curses out for, for, and, be, and be, made, be set free from them in the name of Jesus. But we can't go back and do anything because of the sins of our ancestors as far as they're concerned. But God has made a way so we can be free from the sins that our ancestors have committed or that we have committed so that the curse can be broken over our lives. I'm going to pray. And then, uh, well, we're... And, and, and then you take authority over each one of your descendants yourself and break the curse that whatever you feel that it is. Father, I come in the name of Jesus as a priest in this place, and I take authority this afternoon over every evil spirit, over every familiar spirit, and I bind their power and break their dominion, and ask for the angels of the Lord to come and be with us here this afternoon, and I know that they're already here, and I thank you for them, Father. I thank you for them uh, t collecting these spirits uh, and binding them up uh, uh, in chains or whatever way you want them bound until the day of judgment, when Jesus shall judge him at the throne of judgment. I thank you for doing that, Father, for asking in the name of the Lord Jesus, and I thank you for it, and I praise you for it. Now, I come against every inherited curse. I come and take authority over it in Jesus' name, and I bind and break the power of it, and I put the blood of Jesus to cleanse and to separate between that curse that's come down through the family line and the person that, that it has come upon. And I thank you, Father, for the blood to cleanse and to wash and to separate. In Jesus' name, I praise you for it. Amen. Let's all stand up while I get organized here. Somebody said we could use a bigger podium. I could use a bigger podium. Okay. Uh, let me get a drink of water, too, before I get started here. Okay, we're trying to cover a lot of area here. Bastard, incest, unbelief, forgetfulness, abused children. That covers many, many areas, many demonic areas. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through a prayer. it would be some repetition of what uh, Glenn had to say. Everybody ready? Okay, praise God. Help me, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. I forgive my ancestors for creating bastards and having incest. Forgive me, Lord Jesus, for creating bastards and having incest with my relatives. Forgive me, Lord Jesus, for my unbelief and lack of faith and trust in you. I break the curses of the bastard, curses of incest, and curses of unbelief. Lord Jesus, forgive me that I, with those that I've had illicit sex with, I forgive those who have forced me to have illicit sex. Now I break the soul ties with all of these people. Forgive me, Lord Jesus, for having sex with beasts or fondling beasts. I break any soul ties with them. Lord Jesus, help me to have a strong belief in you and to control the sexual drive 
within me that is so strong. Lord Jesus, I forgive my ancestors and anyone else who has sinned against me, especially in the sexual area. I ask that you forgive them and bless them with all spiritual blessings. Forgive me, Lord Jesus, for my many sins, especially my sexual sins. I forgive myself for sinning against my body by sexual sins. Now I break every curse, every hex, every demonic tie that binds. I break every soul tie brought about by witchcraft or sexual impurity through the bastard, through incest, through molestation, or through bestiality. Now, Lord Jesus, stir up the demons within my subconscious mind that are there because of the terrible hurt that I received when I was molested. Lord Jesus, stir up the demons within my soul. I ask that you would restore it and it would become whole again. Send your angels out to recover anything that Satan has stolen from me. Any part of my soul or any part of my body. Now, Lord Jesus, I am a Christian. I am greater than the enemy because of what you did for us. Now, I take authority over Satan according to the Holy Word of God, the whole Word of God. In Jesus' name. And I command every evil spirit to leave me that I have taken away your legal reign. And I tell you, Satan, I don't enjoy sin and I don't enjoy sexual sin and I don't want to burn in the pit with you. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Okay. Uh, stand up again. Uh, let's let's get a little more specific here. Uh, okay, Glenn Irma mentioned something to me. I'm going to try to be specific, and I'm going to give you a few moments in silent prayer. See, the more specific we can get, and if you're if you let's say that uh, that's Jane and Joe forced her or something. Okay, if Jane would say in her mind, not out loud, I forgive you, Joe, for raping me, or I forgive you, John, for having sodomizing me. See, the more specific you get, the more effective we are. Okay. Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive my mother, my father, my brothers and sisters, my children, my aunts and uncles, grandmothers and grandfathers, any close relatives, our friends, our cousins, nephews and nieces, anyone, Lord, that I've had sex with, that has forced me or molested me or that I have forced or molested, I forgive those who have raped me or, or abused me in any way. In Jesus' name I pray. And I break all soul ties with all of these people. For it's in His name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. 
Okay, in the name of Jesus Christ, I come against those spirits of rejection. I command you to come in. I specifically come against those spirits of rejection that come in through sexual sins. Now, come out. Spirits of rejection. Rejection. Fear of rejection. Self-rejection. I command you to go in Jesus' name. Now, go. Loose us and set us free in Jesus' name. That's right. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to go. I bind your power and I drive you out in Jesus' name. Spirits of rejection. Fear of rejection, self-rejection, inability to give and receive love, prenatal rejection, conception and lust, rejection by the mother, the father, brothers and sisters. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out. I want all this rejection and especially rejection that comes in through sex. I command you to go in Jesus' name. I come out of the people right now. Loose them and set them free. I loose the spirits of love upon this people <clears throat> in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, just let them know that they are loved, Father, that no matter what has happened to them, Lord, that they are loved. <clears throat> now, come out all this rejection, fear of rejection, self-rejection, inability to give and receive love, prenatal rejection, conception and lust, touch me not spirits. Come out of them right now in Jesus' name. I stir you up and I drive you out. And I remind every demon that you'll be cast in the lake of fire and brimstone, where there be weeping and gnashing of teeth, where the worm shall never die and the fire shall never be quenched. You'll be cast in there with your master, Satan. You'll be in total loneliness and total despair. You have very little time left. You'll have maggots on your head and worms on your feet. Now, come out in Jesus' name. Come out. Come out of the children, too. I command you to come out of anyone within the sound of my voice. Come out right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out. All that rejection, all those hurts and deep hurts and scars and nests and habits, come out. Come out that whole family of rejection. Roots, memories, scar nests, and habits, ruler demons, and lesser demons, I stir you up and I drive you out. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Signs will follow those that believe. In my name they shall cast out demons. Now come out. We are in agreement. We are in agreement. We don't want these demons. And we fall out of agreement with you and we drive you out. We have no desire for that illicit sexual sin. Now come out. Come out, loose them and set them free right now. Come on out. I stir you up and I drive you out. I command you to bow your knee to Jesus Christ and do what he's telling you to do and go where he's telling you to go. And I command you to go out and walk around in dry places and not come back again. Come out, demons, in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out. I hate that spirit of rejection. I hate you. I hate what you have done to the human race. I hate all sin and iniquity. I hate everything that God hates. I have no pity on you, demons, and I command you to come out in Jesus. Now, come out of the people. Come out. All that deep-seated rejection and hurts and deep hurts and scars and this. Come out. I especially come against rejection that comes in through a woman being molested by her father or by her brother or by one of her loved ones or being raped. I come against that, that deep-seated rejection that comes in through the woman being molested. And I come against that deep-seated rejection that comes in through a boy being molested by his father, sodomized by his father. Come out in Jesus' name. Come out. I stir you up and I drive you out. Now, loose us and set us free. And Lord, I just pray that you would send your angels, warring angels, ministering angels, the Holy Spirit, the sevenfold Spirit of God to come down here. Lord, we call for total all that spiritual warfare. Lord, we just pray that you would you'd send your angels to cut those demons out, cut their roots out in Jesus' name. Put a hook in their jaw and pull them out in Jesus' name. Light a fire under them ten times hotter than hell. Now, come out of you. Come out, demons. I command you to come out. I break your power and I drive you out. You have no choice. You will come out of us in Jesus' name. You are defeated. Jesus Christ completely defeated you. He puts you to open shame on the cross. Your time is limited. You'll be tormented for eternity. Now, come out. All that rejection. I want all that rejection to go in Jesus' name. Now, come out. Spirits of bitterness. Bitterness that comes in through rejection and rejection through sexual sin. All the bitterness. Bitterness is tied in with sexual sin. I come against the bitterness that comes in through the husband mistreating the wife. The husband mistreating the wife sexually. Or for that matter, the wife mistreating the husband sexually. Come out. The bitterness that comes in through being mistreated by husband or wife. Come out. Come out. That spirit of bitterness, I command you to go in Jesus' name. Come out. The bitterness that comes in through being mistreated. The husband mistreats the wife sexually. Come out the demons that come in where the husband sodomizes the wife. Come out demons that come in where the husband sodomizes the wife. I command you to go in Jesus' name. Now come out. 
Come out, sodomy of the husband on the wife. I command you to go. Come out, that unholy sex in married people. I call you out and I drive you out. That unholy sex among married people. Now loose them and set them free in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out, all this bitterness and unholy sex and uncleanliness. Come out, spirits of bitterness, resentment, hatred, self-hatred. Come in, that self-hatred that comes in for people who have been sodomized or brutalized. Come out that brutality. Come against spirits of brutality and cruelty. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out spirits of brutality and cruelty. Come out spirits of brutality and cruelty and, and sodomize. Come out the spirits of sodomize where a wife is or husband has been sodomized. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out spirits of brutality. Sexual brutality. Sexual cruelty. I command you to go in Jesus' name. I come out of the people right now. Loose them. Loose them and set them free in the name of Jesus Christ. You have no choice. Come out every spirit of bitterness, resentment, hatred, unforgiveness, violence, temper, anger, murder, suicide, death, abortion. Come out spirits of abortion and killing spirits and murder spirits. We command those to go in Jesus' name. Come out the killer spirits and the murder spirits that kill children. Come out the spirit of Moloch. Come out the spirit of Moloch. Sacrificing the children in the fire. Burning, burning the aborted children. I command you to go in Jesus' name. Come out spirits of Moloch. I bind your power and drive you out in Jesus' name. Now come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Every spirit of bitterness, roots, memories, scarness, and habits, ruler demons, and lesser demons, I command you to come out. Go. Go. Spirits of bitterness, I command you to go in Jesus' name. Come out. Bitterness over sex and it being improperly treated. I bind your power and I drive you out in Jesus' name. Now come out. Spirits of rebellion. Rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. I break that tie between rebellion and witchcraft. I drive you out in the name of Jesus Christ. Now go. That rebellion, that witchcraft, I command you to go. Sexual witchcraft. Come out. Spirits of sexual witchcraft and sexual uh, orgies and so forth and demonic orgies. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Sex among multiple partners. Why swapping demons? I command those to go in Jesus' name. Now come out. Loose them and set them free in the name of Jesus Christ. Now come out right now. Every spirit of self-will, selfishness, self-idolatry, sexual selfishness. I call out those sexual selfishness demons. I come against those demons in the husband who thinks he can have sex anytime he wants to and any way he wants to with his wife. Come out the sexual selfishness demons. I command those to go in Jesus' name. Now loose them. Loose them and set them free in Jesus' name. Now go. We break your power and we drive you out in Jesus' name. Now come out. Spirits of uh, uh, disobedience, come out. Spirits of disobedience, obedience is better than sacrifice. Disobe disobeying God's word in the sexual area, come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out. All spirits of stubbornness, stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry. Come out. That spirit of stubbornness, sexual iniquity, sexual lawlessness, come out in Jesus' name. Come out. Sexual iniquity and sexual lawlessness, come out. We bind your power and we drive you out in the name of Jesus Christ. Now go. Spirits of anti-submissiveness, unwillingness of the wife to submit to the husband for normal sex. Come out. Come out, anti-submissiveness of the woman who will not submit to the husband for normal sex. Come out right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out. Come out, spirits of kinky sex. I call you out in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out, spirits of kinky sex. Go in the name of Jesus Christ. Go. Come out, the spirit of the bastard. I call out the spirit of the bastard. Come out, the spirit of the bastard. Go in Jesus' name. Come out, every spirit of fornication, idolatrous sex orgies. Come out in Jesus' name. Spirits of adultery, masculine women, effeminate men, abusers of themselves with mankind, are, are Senecoites, sodomites, oral sex, anal sex. Come out in Jesus' name. Come out all sensual demons, carnality, voluptuous. Come out out of the senses. I call out the demons, the, the sexual demons out of the senses. Come out of the sex organs, out of the reproductive organs, out of the mouth. Come out right now. Come out of the anal area. I command you to go in Jesus' name. Come out. Sensual appetites. I call you out in Jesus' name. Come out. Sensual appetites. Go in Jesus' name. Come out. Spirits of evil concupiscence, inordinate affections, excessive affections, lasciviousness, lewd emotions, filthy communication, obscenity, blasphemy, profanity, sexual profanity, sexual jokes. Come out in Jesus' name. Come out, spirits of masturbation, homosexuality, catamite spirits. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out, spirits of lesbianism, pornography, exposure, uncleanliness, perversion, sexual lust, sexual passions, fantasy lust, sexual fantasies, 
obscene music, poetry, literature, and art, demons that come in through that, come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out, spirits of occult sex, immorality, incest, spirit of incest, come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out, bastard and incest, spirit of harlotry, rape, frigidity, uh, uh, <clears throat> prostitute spirits, come out in Jesus' name. Come out, spirits of bad sexual dreams and sexual nightmares that come in through rape and so forth. Come out in Jesus' name. Come out, spirits of heterosexuality and bisexuality, spirits of drunkenness and drugs that come in through, uh, through uh, sexual sins. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out, spirits of abnormal rejection, lust, unsettledness, irresponsibility, anger, hate, envy, self-dissatisfaction, lack of intimacy, sexual impurity, alcoholism, drug addiction, distraction, Ahab spirits, Jezebel spirits, Asmodeus, automatic failure, inability to communicate, fear of trouble, ignoring problems, obsessive compulsive behavior, indecisiveness, religious troubles, strife, false ministry, hard-hearted, inability to give and receive love, antisocial behavior, divorce, separation, self-consciousness, shame, embarrassment, fears, quitting, fear of failure, and fear of authority, pressure, sexual pressure, lack of joy, lack of trust. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out. I call out all the bastard incest spirits, and I command you to go in Jesus' name. Come out. Come out the bastard incest spirits and abused children spirits. Come out. Spirits of sexual molestation, child abuse, hatred for men, hatred for women, uh, fondling, sexual fondling with the wrong person, Se uh, child sexual games, games that children play um, when they're young with fondling each other and so forth. I uh, call out the Moabite spirit and the Ammonite spirit. Come out the victim spirit, spirit of being victimized, spirit of nakedness. Come out, spirits of nakedness and exposure, spirits of bestiality, uncleanliness, unholiness. Come out in Jesus' name. Come out, spirits of confusion, confusion over sex, not knowing what normal sex is. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Spirits of iniquity and lawlessness, sexual lawlessness, sexual license, come out in Jesus' name. Sexual idolatry, come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Sexual idolatry, spirits of disobedience, come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out, all these incest demons, we command you to go in Jesus' name. We bind your power and drive you out right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Now go. Go in the name of Jesus Christ. We command you to go. Now come out. The sexual diseases. I call that spirits of venereal diseases. Gonorrhea. Soft sh uh, chancroid. In, uh, granuloma inguinal. Spirochetal infection. Syphilis. Congential syphilis. Gonorrheal arthritis. Venereal lymphogranuloma. AIDS. Spirit of AIDS. AIDS. Acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Come out in Jesus' name. Come out, spirits of meningitis, endocarditis, sterility, feeble-mindedness, epilepsy, insanity, staggering gait, heart disease, blindness, ulcerative lesions, yaws, bejel, penta, relaxing fever, tropical ulcer, rat bite fever, wheels disease, herpes 1 and herpes 2, alcoholics. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out right now. All these sexual diseases, we break your power and drive you out in Jesus' name. Now go. Loose them and set them free in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out. Spirits of sexual diseases, we call you out in Jesus' name. Now come out. All the abused children demons. I call out the demons that come in through a child being abused. Come out. The victim spirit. Beating. Hate. Guilt. Retaliation. Destruction. Pouting, cursing, berating, inferiority, loneliness, timidity, shyness, inadequacy, ineptness, suspicion, jealousy, spite, hatred, cruelty, contention, daydreaming, fantasy, distrust, pretension, unreality, escapism, indifference, stoicism, passivity, sleepiness, Alcoholism, drug addiction, quarreling, fighting, torment, harassment, funk, listlessness, lethargy, depression, despair, despondency, 
disgust, discouraged, defeated, sadism, driving. Come out in Jesus' name. Come out every spirit of discontentment, dejection, hopelessness, suicide, death, uh, welcome fantasy, death wish, uh, suicide, morbidity, heaviness, gloom, false burdens, worry, dread, apprehension, nervousness, excitement, schizophrenia, mental illness, retarded, madness, manic depressive, paranoia, unfairness, fear of judgment, fear of condemnation, fear of accusation, fear of reproof, sensitiveness, hallucinations, nightmares, confusion, frustration, forgetfulness, incoherence, doubt, unbelief, skepticism, indecision, procrastination, compromise, pride, ego, fear of authority, lying and deceit, for protection, pretense, backbiting, no peace. Go in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out every spirit of covetousness, stealing, kleptomania, material lust, food lust, greed, criticism, intolerance, irritability, competition, driving, argument, grief, sorrow, heartache, heartbreak, crying for control of others, sadness, laziness, death, cursing, gossip, mockery, belittling, railing, idleness, self-pity, self-reward, self-hatred, self-awareness, self-condemnation, self-protection, sexual impurity, lust, incest, fantasy lust, masturbation, homosexuality, harlotry, rape, exposure, frigidity, murder, hyperactive. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Vile affections, theatrics, divination, false gifts, and fruits, mind control, witchcraft, and rebellion. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Now go, loose them and set them free. Line up in rank and file and order and come out quickly. We bind every power that you have. We loose ourselves from you in Jesus' name. Father, we take authority over all these areas that uh, Jean has called out. And I bind all these spirits. Break their power and dominion over everybody present or everybody that hears this. That they will have to obey. And then, for in the name of the Lord Jesus, we speak these things to be so. And it is written that you have to obey, Satan. And we thank you, Jesus, for the authority of the name of your name. And we use that as the dominion over these spirits. And we break their dominion over the people that they must go in Jesus' name. And we bind them to the day of judgment. And thank you, Lord, that the angels will keep them till that day. We praise you for it, Father. We thank you, Lord, for taking out the, the spirit of unbelief from us. And we'll be able to believe the word that it is written. And we'll be able to, uh, to do that which is, is uh, uh, written in the word. And we'll be able to walk in holiness and righteousness before you. For you desire a holy people. And, we, and Father, we thank you that we're being getting the spots and wrinkles out. And that we're coming to an understanding of the holiness of the Lord and your word, that we hide your word in our heart, that we sin not against thee. We thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let's stand. Uh, Paul, unless somebody's praying with you for something, everybody stand. And let's ask the Holy Spirit to, to come in to, to fill every area that has been vacated or possibly vacated. You do it. I'll pray and you do it too. Father, I ask you in Jesus' name. For the Holy Spirit to fill every area in my vessel that's been vacated so that there's no place for anything to return, for they'll find the area full of the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. This is the end of this message. Our website is www. LakeHamiltonBibleCamp.com and LHBCOnline.com There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.